Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic. We got Scott Geralimo, head coach at Prince George. He's our uh, guest co-host today. And we got Jermaine Johnson coming on talking about their culture at EC Glass. Uh, first, uh, Scott, um, introduce yourself to uh, Total Pole Nation and to uh, the CFC Clinic, and then we'll turn it over to Coach Johnson. Yeah, I uh uh, Scott Jerome from Prince George County High School, uh, south of Richmond, playing uh, uh, Region 5C. I'm really excited just to have a chance to listen to what Coach Johnson's got to say. I, uh, I'm lucky enough to, to have known Coach Woody for a few years and have followed them, but certainly uh, just have this format where, um, Troy, you're pro presenting people who come and, and give really valuable information and uh, best practices and ways for us all to get better. And this one, this topic, really hits home for, I think, yeah. a lot of us coaches. And so I just can't wait to hear what Coach Johnson has to say and uh, maybe pick his brain while I'm at it. Yeah. If you have any comments, um, it's not live streaming on Facebook, but if you go to the YouTube live stream, um, if you put your comments in there, it will pop up, and then I can show Coach um, what your question is. It is live streaming on Twitter. I don't know if you reply on Twitter if it will show up, but I know it will on YouTube. So, Coach Johnson – Yes, uh, tell the clinic a little bit about yourself. All right. Um, yeah, first, man, just I want to thank you, man, for having me on, man. You know, um, I think anytime as coaches, anytime we get a chance to, like, highlight our program and, you know, talk about our guys, man, like, at the end of the day, that's why we got in this profession, right, is for the for the young men themselves. So I thank you for the opportunity to talk about the, the, the program of EC Glass, right? Um, but, man, a little bit about myself, man. I'm from Lynchburg. I actually graduated from the – Rival school, Heritage, uh, played football there for Chris Jones uh, my senior year. Um, graduated there, played football at Virginia State. And then I actually came back and coached at Heritage. I, I coached at Heritage under Coach Jones and from 05, I think, was my first year there. Coached with him and coached at Heritage under Coach Doug Smith as well. Um, so I was at Heritage from 05 to 2011. Um, then I took a year off. Then I coached. Uh, at at Appomattox with Coach Smith, actually. Um, and in 2014, I came to Glass, and I've been at Glass since 2014. Um, so, done a little bit of everything, man, under the sun, you know, um, coaching. I've coached everything, every position on the field. I've uh, been an offensive coordinator, co offensive coordinator, now defensive coordinator. A um, little bit of everything and, and everything else in between, man. Volunteer coach, uh, started out as a volunteer coach on JV working for free. Um, and, you know, now I'm fortunate enough, uh, been teaching and coaching at glass now nine years. So it's a little bit about my, my coaching history. So some of the names you mentioned for the guys that are out of state right. or around the country, uh, coach Jones, I think he won multiple state championships yeah. at yeah. heritage and you were a part of, you know, his so, staff as a player and as a coach. Right, and then, right. then coach Smith at Appomattox has won, multiple state championships so could you could you tell yeah. the clinic a little bit about your experience coaching with those guys yeah absolutely man so you know man, i'm very fortunate right so i've been coaching now high school football now 15 years um i've not been a head coach yet um i've had some opportunities but you know it's it's been all about the right fit and the right time and and i haven't felt that all of those things lined up so long story short you know a lot of people you know wonder why i haven't been a head coach yet and you know I, i'm I've been fortunate enough, man, where I've been in positions where three of the, to, in my opinion, three of the, the best coaches in, in the state of Virginia history, right? Yeah, like, I like, forgot about Woody. I mean, Woody's yeah, won exactly. multiple state championships at Brookville. Right. I mean, what am I thinking? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I've mm -hmm. been fortunate enough, man, to, to play for Coach Jones and start my coaching career under him, play for Coach Smith, because uh, he was one of the assistant coaches on our on our state championship team. I won a state championship under Coach Jones at Heritage. And um, so, man, I've been fortunate enough, man, just to, to, to soak up all the knowledge I can and learn from those guys. Um, but, you know, it was very different. All three are very different. Um, Coach Jones and Coach Smith, I would say, are a little bit more similar um, in the sense that um, they're more like type A personality guys. Right. Um, like this is the way it is. This is the way it's going to be. But that's because they have you know, they know that's that's what they want to have this vision, right? Coach Woody, you know, on the flip side of that, um, not 
not that it's wrong or not that it's any worse, but because, I mean, the guys won multiple championships, but his personality is very different. Coach Woody's the youngest of the three, so I think he's a little bit more, uh, you know, in, in, in tune, I guess, in terms of closer in age. And so, you know, he's more laid back. He, he's more of a jokester, a prankster, you know, that traditional saying, a, a player's coach. Well, that's what that's what Coach Woody is. Um, you know, he's going to make everybody feel welcome. Not that the other guys don't, but, you know, Coach Woody is definitely – more of a laid back. He's the type of coach that he's going to, um, you know, trust, you know, give his guys the responsibility um, and let them do their job. So I've, I've been fortunate enough, man, to learn a lot from all three of those guys. And so, you know, it's been, it's been a great experience under all three. I think that's helped me become such a better coach, having an opportunity to work under three different, very different coaching styles and, Offensive philosophies, man, their offensive philosophies have been different. Defensive coordinators have been different under those guys. So I've learned a lot in that situation. Yeah, Scott, have you got anything that you, you want to ask uh, Jermaine before he gets going? Um, no, this, it's fascinating. I, I got to believe you, you know, you already hit on it, but I got to believe you took a little bit of everybody. And, right. Um, yeah. And, and, you probably do the same thing with your guys and yeah and um and, and the guys that you're working with now i'm sure there's two or three young assistants on your staff right now that just look right. up to you and and yeah. hear your stories about them and um, yeah i know who you're talking about i had the yeah, yeah. uh I had the misfortune of uh of running into <laughs> appomattox in, in one of those state championship games so um, yeah. just tremendous uh coaches that you uh um, you follow in that lineage yeah I, and i i mean like i can't really express enough man like especially like coach coach Smith specifically um, you know, he was my JV coach when I played JV, he was our JV coach. And like, um, you know, that dude was a lot more than just a football coach. You know, he's definitely more like a father figure to me. And then coach Jones gave me my first opportunity. You know, he's the one I, he I, single-handedly, you know, he offered me my first job when I didn't even think about coaching football. So can't thank those dudes enough, man, for, for, you know, me being in the position I'm in now, honestly. You know, just me and Scott were talking before we came on air and we were talking about how you define success. And, right. You know, from being a young head coach, you know, I think I was 29. You know, I was so caught up on my record. Right. And, you know, what our record was. And I mean, just, just yeah. listening to you talk about those coaches that you, um, you know, coached with and for. I mean, that, that's success. I mean, you're always yeah, in the mix. Yeah. You're in the playoffs. I mean, state yeah. championships is the ultimate goal. But, you know, it's uh, after the COVID season, we had a losing season at L.C. Bird, which I think has never happened. Right. Um, I, I had a coach to coach with me that played for Bear Bryant and okay. was recruited by Bruce Arians, Mike Spencer. And he said, Troy, listen to Saban, listen to Saban. You know, yeah. stop focusing on the results and focus on the process. Yeah, so, exactly. And then I just want to say one more thing before you get going, Coach, and I'll share this with everybody at the clinic because somebody told me it uh, this week. Corey Heatherman that's coaching at Rutgers, uh, you know, used to be at JMU and used to be at ODU. Um, he was telling me about Bill Belichick and how, you know, Belichick's son walked on there at Rutgers, but he comes and he goes to the meetings. And I said, well, man, just tell me three things about Bill Belichick. And the first thing he said was, one, he don't play around. <laughs> so like I'm sure he's a jokester sometimes, but yeah, when it's yeah. time to work, it's time to work. Right. And then like the second thing he said was he listens to everybody. Like he listens to everybody. He takes in what everybody else is saying. And then three, like he tells it like it is. Yeah. So like that that was the three things I wanted to share that with the clinic before you get going. Yeah. Um, but thank you for coming on, Jermaine. It's your show. I, I'm going to ask a lot of questions just because that's the only way I can learn, man. Yeah. Hey, hey, I, please, please do, man. Uh, I think, you know, I'm the same way. Right. I'm the dude on the staff that I'm going to ask why I'm going to ask, you know, explain that again. And it's not, you know, that that's just how I learn. So uh, please do. Please do. So. All set. Yeah, brother. All right. So yeah, I think you, if you want to share the screen, you should have it there. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit today about, you know, leadership development, um, creating a, a winning culture. And, you know, you mentioned about how you define success. Well, again, this, the word winning, you can, you can interpret that however you like, you know, for us, it started with, uh, off the field, winning off the field in the classroom and just so happened, 
the byproduct of that was winning on the field, right? Um, when give you a little bit of background, when I got to Glass in 2014, um, Glass had not had a winning season in varsity football uh, since 2005. They finished 2005 at seven and five, and then from 2006 to 2016, or there was not a season where they won more than four games in football. Now, I don't know how much you guys or the people listening know about the tradition. And I the do. See glass football, right? Yeah, I know about it. Right. So you're talking about a powerhouse. Like to this day, EC glass is second most wins in VHSL history behind Hampton high school. Um, mm-hmm. So it's that type of program. And they fell on hard times. They, you know, they had a chance. Uh, they made it to the state semifinals, I think in 98 or really deep run in 98. And then from 98 to really, this year, you know, we or the last couple of years, you know, we, we we're trying to rebuild a program. Well, so we'll talk about the things that that we did to turn to change the culture. Ultimately, that's what it was that that had to happen at EC Glass. We had to change the culture. So, um, well, how, how do you define culture? Because like I, I define culture kind of as like you said, you're a history teacher. It, it's our way of life. So yeah, how, how do you yeah, define yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you know, the old saying, man, the old cliche saying how you do anything is how you do everything. Um, and to me, I really it's old, it's cliche, but I, I, I think it's true. And, you know, so that's that's kind of what what I, our philosophy is. Right. Like winning is not a sometimes thing. You know, Coach Woody always says it's an all the time thing and you have to win. And, and by winning, we mean giving your best, doing your best in every aspect of your life. And again, you know, it's not. You know how you do everything is how you gonna do anything, and the the passion, the the effort that you put in, and to me that's the culture, right? When you want to do the right thing, we had to get our guys at Glass. We had to get to the point where they wanted to do the right thing and not be influenced, because you know Glass is an inner city school. Um, you know we have a lot of uh, students. Majority of our students come from low income neighborhoods, and so there's a lot of outside influence, right? And for I think for years the outside influence was winning the guys and stuff, you know, and so we just had to change the culture by getting our guys to want to do the right thing more times, more often than not. You know, I think that's the easiest way to, to put it. And I think when you make the right decisions, the, all, all the other things will fall in line, you know, if you make the right decision. So um, coach, I'm trying to change the screen here, but it's not, you might have to change it. Uh I don't know, Coach. Um, can you can you look at it where it's just it's, you just have your PowerPoint up there, and you can flip to the next slide. Let me see. I'm trying to go. It says there's no slides here. Add file from. Yeah, because I I only have I only have control over to add oh, it to the whether screen. you're sharing or not. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so I wonder how we can. Wonder if we can do it here. All right, so I stopped sharing just now. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, Coach. So if we don't have a slide, you, yeah, you get you get that going, Coach. And I'll just ask Scott something. Scott, you know, um, I, I recruited some of your players when I was coaching at Virginia Union. You were at Robert E. Lee, um, and you know, you you coached for a state championship. Y'all are a state finalist a year. Um, you went to Battlefield. I think you went to the regional championship, and then you know you you went and took over the job there at Prince George. Uh, just from what Coach has said so far, you know what 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 do you agree with? Um, you know what he's talking about. Well, I, I, I the thing that resonated with me the most, uh, which I think has been the maybe the biggest struggle, is. Um, trying to separate uh, the success of choosing the, the right and for, um, you know, the success of, of winning a single rep or a single drill or a single day, single practice from um, success on the field and knowing that one precedes the other and that uh, getting young men to buy into doing that, that, that doing the right thing over and over and over and over again will inevitably lead you to uh, what ultimately we're, we're going for, which is uh, to, you know, be a better man, beginning or at the end of the season that you were at the beginning and uh so i can't wait to hear what he's got to say going looks like he's got it ready to go on on that topic yeah i think we're good to go now i think i figured it out <laughs> hey, it's okay coach let's roll all right let's do it 
All right. So um, on this slide right here, you'll see throughout the history, right? Like prior to we, we got there, Coach Woody got hired. I got hired actually in 2014 under uh, the previous head coach. And I was there one year before Coach Woody. Uh, we didn't have record. You know, we finished that season at three and seven. I can tell you that. But I don't know what our team GPA was. But you can see there throughout the years, Coach Woody's very first season there, we, we had a 2.5 GPA and we finished one and nine. And you notice that asterisk right there. That's because actually we end up forfeiting that game. We had we had a kicker, our backup kicker. Uh, apparently we found out later he was ineligible and he was on the field for one play where he never touched the ball. Um, and so we had to forfeit the game because we had an ineligible kicker. But anyway, nonetheless, one and nine, zero and ten, whatever. It doesn't make a difference at that point. Um, but then after the 2015 season, man, what you know, what we realized was, you know, we just didn't have a whole lot of accountability among our guys um, in the classroom. They they were slacking in the classroom, and a lot of people don't know this, but you guys know, like I know, the VHSL the only requirement for eligibility. If you have a seven bell schedule, you got to pass five out of seven. You have a block, you got to pass three out of four. But passing in most school systems are is a D or D minus. So according to VHSL, you can be eligible with five D minuses and two Fs, right? But that wasn't that wasn't working for us. So in 2016, we put something in place called the blueprint. And what that was was we demanded academic accountability in the classroom where the guys had to maintain at least a 2.0 GPA um, throughout the school year. And, and then also we had to have 80 percent off, off season uh, attendance to workouts. And, um, you know, after that 2014, 2015 season, I mean, we had, you know, guys that you might have in the off season over the summer. You might have 20 guys in the weight room and you guys know, like I know, that's not going to cut it. You know, especially if these guys we're talking about guys that are not doing other sports. It's different if you're playing another sport. Right. So. The offseason going into 2016, we put the blueprint into place and you can see the immediate success where the team GPA went to a 2.8. Immediately, we won six and four. We went six and four that season. We missed the playoffs at six and four. But you can see from there on up until this year, our GPA increased every year. Um, 2021 was uh, coming off the COVID season, so it dipped a little bit um, to a 3.0. But uh, and we this year we're still in progress. But right now we're at like a 3.0 for the year. Uh, hopefully that'll go up. But you can see the immediate correlation. And I'm a firm believer it started because we demanded that 2.0 in the classroom. And we you know, we provide study hall for the guys and everything. So it's not like, hey, you got to get a 2.0 on your own. We have uh, tutors available for them. We do study hall every day before off season, before lifting after school. We do study hall for the guys as well. So we have the resources in place for them. Um, and so the direct correlation was our team GPA increased um, all the way to the point where our wins on the field increased as well. Hey, Jermaine, let me ask you something about, you know, that 2014 season and coaching for another right. uh, head coach. You know, there might be somebody watching the podcast, the clinic, and they could be the guy who they're in limbo. Right. You know, I'm, I worked for the, the the old head coach. Now there's a new guy coming in. You know, it's yeah, high yeah. school ball. You're in the building or you could be the guy taking the job. Correct. And there could be a guy in the building. You know, do I keep him? Do I not? Right. right. Um, so could you talk from the perspective of being the guy in the building and how you handled that and, and how you got to stay? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> you know, I try to, again, I, I, I try to live my life and my coaching and my career by the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And like one thing about me, man, I'm, I'm going to give everything I have at all times. And I've always been like a team player type of guy. So, you know, I don't mind doing the dirty work. I'm never too big. I don't care like what my job title is, what my pay is. Like I'll do laundry, I'll line the field, whatever needs to be done. Right. Um, and so I think, having that reputation um i've always been fortunate enough where the guys that i've worked under they've always been able to give me good references right and the fact that i worked in the building that's a plus because it's very difficult nowadays to find guys that work in the building who also want to coach and so i had that you know going for me um i think the staff the 2014 staff of the guys that worked in the building i think myself and only one other guy you know, came back. The other guys, they left and went on. 
But so I think, you know, coming in, you guys know how it is taking over a new program. It's always good to have people in the building that, you know, are or people on the staff that are 100 percent bought in. And I think um, being in the building clearly says that you're 100 percent bought in. So I think that helped a lot. So, so talk a little bit about, you know, you haven't been a head coach yet, but right. you know, from, from my perspective, it looks like um, that you've had a lot of responsibility. Right. So when you do get that opportunity, you'll be ready. You know, a yeah. lot of people just want the position, right. but since you were the guy that got kept, right. you know, how will you handle this when you become a head coach? Cause sometimes in interviews, they ask this, well, what would yeah. you plan on doing with, yeah, um, the the old staff because sometimes they just want you to get rid of everybody. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So how 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 will you handle that when you're the head coach? Yeah, same way I think. Right. Um. Again, you got to have guys that you know are gonna go to bat for you. Um. And you know, co as coaches, we're not perfect, but I think you got to have all the arrows pointing in the same direction. Right. There's there's more than one way to skin a cat, but at the end of the day, football is about blocking and tackling, no matter how you dress it up. And so having guys that i know having guys that i trust having guys that i know have my back and they're going to believe in what i believe in i think is how you decide who who you keep or you know who you move on from um and so ultimately too sometimes you get in a situation where you kind of you kind of left with what you have because a good problem to have is a lot of the assistant coaches right if you have some success people start reaching out to your assistant coaches and trying to pluck them from the staff because you guys have have had success. So this is one of those things, you know, it just depends on, you know, who's available. And again, who you can who, you know, is going to be all in. Right. I, I, I want guys to to be all in and guys that are available, available. Sometimes the best ability is availability. <laughs> so. <laughs> So that's I think that's how I would handle that. Right. Go to first who's available, but then also who who's in. Right. Who's all in. Yeah. Right? Who 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 can who do you know that's going to have your back and have these kids back at the end of the day? Yes, sir. You know, for everybody that's been watching all the podcasts, you're probably going to say, Troy, you're saying the same thing every every podcast. But if you haven't watched the Coach Mike Smith podcast he did with Kirk and Bird, he, he talks about his staff that he had at Hampton and, you know, the winningest program in the history of Virginia, right. you know, EC glasses too. But he said he had three things. Uh, one, he had guys that love the school. Yeah, He had exactly. two guys that love the kids yeah. and then three guys that love the game. Yeah, and he absolutely. said, when you have that, you have something special. So yeah. like that, that was so powerful when he said that I wrote it down on our board. Yeah. I'm about to do the same thing. I'm going to make a note of that myself because I mean, it's, uh, you're exactly right. Um, because it's a, it's not about them. It's not about you at that point. Right. It's not about you. It's about the school. It's about football. And it's about the guys that, that you're coaching. Nowhere mm -hmm. in that equation do, do you, the coach, fit in. So that's how you know when you when you're able to put yourself um, before others, then you got I think you you have something special. So. Yeah. So um now this this presentation is kind of long, man. So I'm not I don't think I'm gonna go through all of it, but I'm gonna try to hit on on the on the meat and potatoes. And and so this I, I started with this screen first because I want people to see the the results. This is a result. Sometimes you put the results at the end, but I think you put the results up front. And and I'm a firm believer, right? In in the system, what we do. So this particular presentation talks about leadership specifically. And this is some this is like a whole program that we put our guys through. Now we were doing it before COVID happened. Um, and then when COVID happened, obviously we had, you know, we didn't have guys in the building, guys were hybrid and some people were it was it was weird. Like yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we yes, couldn't we meet. Yeah, we couldn't meet and everything. So we 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 trying to we're gonna try to re-implement this in 2023. Uh, this season coming up, but you see this couple things. We 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 get with our guys uh, fall camp, and we we teach them this, and this is what EC Glass football is about. Um, and you know, you can see the bullet points there, and we we try to instill this in our guys, especially the freshmen coming in. Right, they're, they're little, you know, like little Bambi out there, little baby deers, you know, in headlights. So we try to teach these guys from an early stage. These are the things of what our program is about. Um, you do these things and then you'll end up having some success. And here's some of the things that we have tradition, some traditions. And again, the top one at the list is compete every day and everything. 
And again, competing is competing with yourself, right? You do everything you can to the best of your ability, and that's competing. And I think at the end of the day, if you give your best, you compete in everything you do, then at night you can lay your head down and you can, you know that you gave everything you had and you can sleep well at night. The second bullet point there is what the majority of this presentation is about, the Football Leadership Council. And, um, you know, we started it out with the select few guys, um, but over the years we've kind of expanded it to anybody. So at first, you know, when I first started doing this, it was guys that are already your leaders, you know, and you, 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 these are your guys, your captains, if you would, and you develop in these guys to try to pass it along. But then, you know, more and more I thought about it, it's like, like anybody, if, if these kids have the desire to want to be leaders, then let's, you know, let's open it up to anybody. And so um, the FLC, the Football Leadership Council, is what the majority of this um, presentation is about. And I'll get into more details about that. Um, and these are just some more of our traditions right here. You know, the top offense and defense in the district, that's not every year, but these are our traditions. This is what we strive to have every single year. Um, and these the other bullet points you see there are, are the things that we strive to have and do as well. And again, it goes back to that word culture, right? All of these things on this list here, only two things, three things on this list actually have to do with on the field things, right? Offense, defense, and special teams. The other eight bullet points, or whatever, how many ever it is, they have nothing to do with on the field things. These are all things that happen off the field. So that goes back to your culture, right? Like how you do things throughout the day in the building and whatnot. Yeah, I, I love the point that you made that you start with, you know, the, what you want at the beginning. So it's like, what is that saying? You, yeah. you start with the the end in mind. Correct. So, like part, well, our part. principal, you know, Elsie Bird, the tradition of football here, it's it's you know, it's up there with glass. It's pretty yeah. important, right? Right. So, like our principal is very supportive, and she, mm -hmm. her her whole thing is like work hard, play hard, and take care of each other. So yeah. we we try to embody that in our program. But like I tell our kids, like th this is the three things that we want out of our program: is one, we want to change lives. Mm -hmm. So like we're, we're trying to make you a better person because you were part of this program. Two, right. we're trying to help get you to the next level, whatever Absolutely. that means. Right. And then three, we're trying to build champions for life. So like I, it took me I mean, I, I think I even had to go through a losing season like like Troy, like what is the most important thing? It's like, boom, those three things. Like right. if, if That's not one of your if, if that ain't your goals, then we're not on the same page. So yeah, like, absolutely. I just wanted to add that in there. Like, it's, it's important to have everybody say, this is what we're doing right here. We're trying to change lives. Yeah. We're trying to help kids get to the next level, whatever that means. And then three, you know, we're trying to build champions for life. So, yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, the wins and losses are a byproduct of doing all those other things, right? I mean, that's that takes care of itself. Um, you know, it's a lot of things that go into winning the football game, but – I think the actual Friday night gameplay is probably the easiest part of, of of a football team, honestly. You know, it's all the other stuff that you have to do off the field. So um, here's a big part, a big, big part of our standards as well. You know, talk about being coachable, you know, and that's some something guys have to learn. You know, it's sometimes as as, as men or the male, the male species, we sometimes our egos think if someone's trying to tell us something. Uh, we sometimes get a, offensive, but no, like I'm literally here to help you. I always tell my guys, um, you know, sometimes they get, you know, get upset or, you know, when they're getting coached hard and it's always like, hey, man, like I'm never going to stop coaching you. So like you're going to have to, you know, I'm here for you. Like I'm I'm not your enemy. I'm here to help you and I'm never going to stop coaching you. So the only way for me to stop coaching you is if you not be on the team. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so you, you have to you have to accept being coachable. And do your coaches like you, right? Like not not necessarily, uh, you know, we're not talking about having favorites or anything, but like, you know, are you a good person? You know what I'm saying? Are you a good person? That's what I mean by do your coaches like you. Maybe I'll change that. I mean, I don't think you should change that because when I was a kid, that's what my dad always told me. He said, Troy, the most important thing is the teacher likes you. The most yeah. important thing is if your boss likes you. Right, and right. What does that mean? I mean, I know a guy that got fired six times in two months from six different <laughs> jobs. He said yeah. they didn't like him. Yeah. And the reason that you got fired is because they didn't like you. And it's pretty yeah. much, I as a coach, I can separate with my students. I can separate the person yeah. from the behavior. And yeah, absolutely. Do they like the behavior. Can they count on yeah. you? Are you dependable? Are there you, you in the weight room? You know, that, yeah, so exactly. I think it's a great coach. 
Yeah, I think I guess it all encompasses that, right? Do the coaches like you. Yeah. If you do yeah. those things, I'm going to like you. If they don't you. like no. you, you're in trouble, man. You're going to get kicked off the team. You're not yeah. going to go to college. You're not going to play. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. there's a respect that you earn through the through the investment, you know, the emotional yeah. investment and that credit that you build with the team. Correct. That earns you the right to maybe once or twice fly off. But if, yeah. if you don't consistently invest and, and you don't build that credit, you can't make that transaction when it's time. Yeah, sweat to equity. Not That's at what Inky yeah. Johnson calls it. There you go. Sweat equity. Definitely got to have right. that sweat equity. That's um, right. So, so yeah, these are some of our standards here. Um, and and the big one, I think the ones I underlined down at the bottom, loving football and, and being dependable. Um, that was one of the biggest issues. Like I said, we had at glass. You know, we have our coaches meeting on Sundays and you got this game plan for this kid. And um, then Monday comes and he's not in school or, you know, Tuesday, he, he's gotten suspended from school or something like that. And so uh, dependable was a big one. We had to change that. Um, so and then also to that last bullet point, you know, we talk about our actions in the school or community and how that affects your role or how it affects the the, the perception of the football team. So, um, yeah, coach, I, I'm going to be real and I'm going to be genuine with you. Yeah. man. I, I was I, I was a little unmotivated. But, really? you know, when you start talking about this, I start getting geeked up because this yeah, is yeah. what I really like. And yeah. you, you put a word up there and it was love. Oh, yeah. And Mike Spencer, who I coach with, he was head coach at St. Thomas Aquinas. He coached at Florida State and Alabama. Yeah. He said that, well, how do you show people or show things that you love them? And it's time and attention. Mm -hmm. You show Absolutely. things that you love your time and attention. So don't tell me you love football when yeah. you don't show it your time and attention. Don't tell me you love your wife and your family when you yeah. don't give them time and attention. Absolutely. So I'm, I guess I'm the old head here. I'm 44. So how old are y'all? <laughs> I'm 38. Uh, I'm the youngest for right now. I'm 37. <laughs> okay. So I used to be the young coach. Yeah. So I got all what? these ideas and everything, but I'm glad I'm here so I, I can help spread it and you can you go. You know, keep it going, y'all. Yeah, man. When you uh, when you coach, when you talk about these standards, yeah, is this also how you're measuring, um, basically how the blueprint is is being effective? Is this how you're, um, you know, evaluating the accountability on the team? And, yeah. So and if if there's more detail that you can go into with this, because you know, this is the world we live in, where yeah. you know we this can this these type of things consistently happen to us, and and I know a lot of other guys that, that watch this. Um, yeah, so where where they're worried about these things, these yeah. these real life things, and how do I, how can I tell if we're getting there? You know. Yeah. So I think for us, right? I think like number like numbers don't tell the whole story, but they're a pretty good baseline, right? And so for us, uh, our quarter just ended. The second quarter just ended. We we track our we pull up our guys' grades and we track their grades throughout the grading period as well. But at the end of the quarter we see where everybody's GPA is, right? And we just realized, like, just noticed, we only have two returning varsity players that are under the GPA requirement requirement as of right now, right? And so I think that's a way you can measure it. That's how we kind of measure if it's working or not, right? Now, to give you an idea, all right, two, maybe that's not good, but coming off of COVID, <laughs> coming off the COVID year, I mean, we probably oh, yeah. had 15 yeah, or 20. about it. Yeah. So I took for us to go from 15 or 20 post COVID to only having two under a 2.0 right now. I think that's a good way. That's kind of the easiest way for us to measure. And then also, too, you don't get just in the building um, going to the do the coaches like you. I could probably put on their teachers, do adults in the building like you. Right. Um, we, we get far less complaints about football players now. We get a lot more compliments about football players, about how they notice the football player, you know, breaking up a fight or instead of being the one in the fight or, uh, you know, helping a, another student in, in hallways or helping a teacher or something. So those types of things, I think, are the way the easiest way to measure it, um, I think, especially the, the just the hard numbers itself of the, the GPA requirements. So um, yeah, which those is, three points are really there at the top were critical. And I yeah. just they're pretty abstract. You know, right. we all want them. We all want coachable kids. Correct. You know, we all, we all want those kids that are, you know, they're dependable. Uh -huh. uh, and, but how, how, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated to find out how, guys, yeah. uh, what does that like look like? Right. What does, measure, yeah, what does that look, look like? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's for us, I think that's, that's how, how we kind of measure that. Right. Is 
And, and I tell kids all the time, man, like like your GPA, the reason colleges look at GPAs, it doesn't tell how smart you are. It tells how self-disciplined you are. It tells how um, how, how teachable you are, teachable, coachable you are. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so I think that GPA, that hard number kind of tells us, OK, if this kid is willing, we've set the standard. He knows what the standards are. Or he knows what the consequences are. If you don't meet these standards, you're not going to be eligible to play in the fall, uh, the following season. And, and they meet that standard. So I think it's pretty clear, right, that they're being dependable. I think it shows that they love football. And we tell guys all the time. I mean, every year we have to cut guys every single year. We've cut guys that were starters. We had, I, remember, I remember the first year we put it in place. Um, a kid was an all-district safety for us as a sophomore. He didn't meet the standard. We cut him. He did not play varsity football as a junior. And then he came back and was all state his senior year. Um, so I think, and we say, like, if you can't get a 2.0, that's a C average. If you're not willing to do the things to get a C average, then you do not love football. Clearly, don't tell me what, don't tell me you love football. Well, if you're not willing to do the things necessary so that you can stay on the team and, and do play the game you love, you do not love football. Like your actions speak louder than your words. And so I mm -hmm. think that's how you measure it, right? If you get in that GPA, then clearly I think you love it enough that you're going to do what you have to do, even if you don't want to do it. Right. Like school's not always fun. Let's not let's be not. industrious. You know, I love it. That's a that's that's an excellent response. Yeah. So I think that's how you how you kind of measure it. So. Yeah. So we started out with a 2.0 GPA. Um, but then we thought about, you know, after we got it set in stone and got guys accustomed to do it, we increased it to a 2.3. Um, and the reason for that is because. That's what the NCAA requirement is, right? We thought about it like, all right, cool. We got a bunch of kids that have 2.0, but they're not even eligible for a Division One scholarship or a Division Two scholarship for that matter, um, because the GPA for Division One is 2.3 and 2.2 for uh, Division Two. So we we increased it to 2.3, and you know, the mindset behind that was, if you don't play college football, it's not going to be because you weren't eligible, right? So we 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 did that. Uh, we bumped it back down after COVID, quite honestly, just because kids were coming off, you know, homeschool and online school and no school at all. <laughs> so we, we we went back to a 2.0, but we're going to go back to a 2.3 this fall, I believe. Um, being a leader, some academic standards, being a leader. We talked about that, about that a little bit. Um, helping others, you know, do you need a tutor? You know, those types of things. And then. All right, we set a team goal. So you have your individual, right, as a, as a 2.3. But then our, excuse me, our goal for the team is a 3.0. And we kind of coaches just sit back and, you know, we kind of decide that 3.0 is usually pretty standard where we kind of keep it, right? I think that's, that's you know, realistic and, and, and feasible for, I think you talk about a, a varsity football team, you know, anywhere between 60 to 80 guys, depending on the number. So, that's kind of some of our academic standards there. And then we go through health and fitness standards. Again, not going to go through every single bullet point, but uh, just again, keep this in mind. This is everything we share with our guys kind of at the beginning of the season, right? Always, always, always <laughs> harp on the things you're putting in your body. And it's not just to help you, the things you should not put in your body. Uh, we harp on that big time as well. So, you know, we all know how it is being a teenager. We all were teenagers once. Uh, so, you know, we like to think all of our little Johnnies and Jimmies are perfect angels, but we know that's not always the case. So we, we harp on probably more what not to put in your body than we do what to, what to put in your body. <laughs> um, this was also for us at EC Glass specifically, this was a big one because, again, majority of our kids, probably 80 percent of our kids in the school receive free or reduced lunch. Um, you know, the city of Lynchburg has like the second or th third highest poverty rate in the state after Norfolk and Richmond City. So um, a lot of our kids, you know, come from impoverished homes and impoverished neighborhoods. And our biggest challenge, these kids, I mean, they, they bust their tail in the weight room, but they're not getting proper nutrition a lot of times outside. So we try to Absolutely. do some things to supplement that. So some of you, you guys might, you know, have a different demographic, but probably same situation. Um, so. Uh, this was for us. This is a big one. And it's still a challenge. Honestly, this might be one of the, the second biggest challenge for us is just getting our guys to proper nutrition. And that's really tough. So but this is something we try to talk to them about, you know, getting rest, too. That's a big one. The rest. People underestimate the importance of rest. You know, they think they can stay up all night long and then yeah. turn and have a good day. Cool. They, they don't, don't sleep. They no. do not sleep. It's no, it's amazing. And it's, it's yeah. brutal. So now the Football Leadership Council, um, 
We just talk about some of the benefits, right? That we try to, because, right, like you t- use the word leader and teenagers nowadays, they don't necessarily think it's cool. It's not why it's not sexy. It's not attractive to be a leader. Right. But we try to try to make it attractive for them. You know, we let them decide our uniform combinations, the guys that are part of the council, they get to decide our uniform combination on game night. Um, they, they're the line leaders in practice. Um, so they, they can be they're eligible, eligible to be a captain on game day. And then also too, we, sometimes we have consulted with members of our leadership council, on discipline issues with their teammates, right? You try to keep it, you try to keep it um, anonymous. You don't talk about the names of the guys, but just here's the details. You know, what do you guys think we should do to handle the situation? And so then we also have um, pride stickers. You know, we have special recognition on your helmet as well. So a couple benefits from being on the leadership council. And the big one I think is um, the the uniform combination is the one that that the guys tend to like the most. Um, they get to decide the uniform the uniform combination, and that's probably the biggest one that kind of motivates guys to want to be on the leadership council. Honestly, um, so a couple of responsibilities we talk about the responsibilities they have there. Um, I'm a big believer, and you you have to lead by example. I was the type I I wasn't the most I was a little bit more vocal my senior year of high school, but um, I was definitely the type like I'm going to lead by example. So I'm the biggest I'm the biggest believer that leaders should be servants. You have to be a servant leader. So you're going to have to clean up locker room. You're going to have to do field cleanup. But that's part of being a leader. Um, so you, you you model the behavior that you want to see. Uh, so a couple other things we do there, a couple other responsibilities, um, the assumptions, just some things we assume. You know, you want to be the best athlete you can be. Obviously, we assume you want to be successful after football. And so these are reasons why we put this in place. A couple of questions we ask our ourselves, our guys, you know, tell them to look at their goals. We actually have them write out goals, uh, an academic goal, a personal goal um, for the for the semester, for the year. And then actually like, you know, down the road, long term, like after high school. And so and then but then we also ask them, OK, look at your behavior. Does your behavior match that goal and we discussed that we have these open discussions among the team in the classroom and whatnot um and so uh this is just a little video it's one of my favorite um one of my favorite motivational speeches right there if y'all get a chance y'all familiar with um what's my man andre eric thomas. thomas eric thomas eric thomas yeah i'll say andre thomas but eric thomas yes the guru speech man that, that that's still to this day that's still one of my favorite speeches right there gets me fired up and so here's some uh cultural cultural things cultural values we talk about like you know you asked about defining culture so here's some of the ingredients that we define as what culture is um so you you have the different things what common values are the common language right um and then common qualities right i think that's how you define and this culture could be defined as in in a city you know but also within a team as well these are you have these common values. People believe the same, you know, common languages, common qualities. Right. We've never met. Right. I've never met you two guys personally, but I, we share a similar culture. And the fact that we I know we have common values, common language and common qualities and customs just because we in the same profession. Right. And so that's how we define kind of what define culture is that our team, you know, model and ethos is who we are, what we're about and how we behave is how you define culture. Right. Coach Taylor, I think you kind of hit on something like that earlier, too, about what culture kind of looks like in your school. You know, everybody wants to talk about discipline. Well, Coach, how you got handled discipline? Or your oh, team's yeah. undisciplined, or you're right. an undisciplined coach. And I, I take the Urban Meyer philosophy, which is discipline is 90% prevention. 100%. I, yeah, like I, I agree with you. It's happening before yeah. it happens. I agree if with you. If you have a disciplined team, you don't have incidences in the locker room. You don't yeah. have incidences after the game where kids are fighting each other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we want to prevent it. And and yeah. when you're disciplined, you have to have somebody. Um, I mean, the word discipline comes from disciple. You have to have yeah. someone that shows you the way. So, like, your leadership council, they're the guys that, hey, this guy is the standard. He is what we are looking for. Correct. He is 100%. what it's about to be you know, on an EC glass football team. He's a 4.0 student. He yeah. never misses a workout. Right. He, I mean, the big thing with Dion, I just saw this on Twitter. I didn't watch the video, 
but he's showing the guys how to treat women. And we talk about that. Yeah. If you can't treat women the yeah. right way, like you're going to have a hard life. Absolutely. You can't be a part of this uh, program. So can you talk a little bit about that? Did y'all see that video that I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Saw that. <clears throat> um, I saw, I don't know if it's the same one, but yeah, I think I did. Was it a, a young lady there speaking to them? Was that the same video you're talking about? That he had like yeah. a female guest speaker? Yeah, I think I did see parts of it. He yeah. lined several women up that were in, in the program. Oh, okay. What did that amount to, Coach? Say again? What What did it amount to if y'all saw it? Because I didn't yeah, see I it. Didn't, I didn't get to see it either. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just really – it was really laying it out there. Uh, at Colorado, we're going to do this. Yeah, we're yeah. going to treat women with respect. Uh, we're going to uh, honor them with the, our behaviors if there's – uh, another person in your life that you're, you know, close to that you're in a relationship with and anything happens that even remotely looks like abuse, you are, it's a wrap is what he said. Yeah. You don't, mm -hmm. no, don't, you don't call, don't text, <laughs> don't email, don't come back, right. don't wear our stuff because you're not going to be a part of our, uh, what we do here. And it was yeah. real short and sweet. Yeah. Um, but specifically, you know, he, he, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, female staff now in and around it these is. programs and yeah. um you know there's coach you know there's coaches on staff that are that are females and you, you know these guys uh i think they respond to him and his message and so uh, it reaches a lot of kids all over the country when he says stuff like that yeah absolutely we had um you know always a little apprehensive you know you're looking for team managers and usually it's, it's female young ladies that want to do it um we had four this year they, they were unbelievable actually like i had you know, we've been, I've been a glass nine years, they would afford, they were just unbelievable. Um, the, the managers we had this year, but yeah, we had that same conversation with our guys as well. Like, look on the buses and stuff the, the managers are sitting up front, first of all, but however, you know, there's going to be times where, you know, you, they're going to get out of your eye gate. You're not going to be able to see your players and your managers hundred percent all of the time. But we had similar conversation, like, you know, at the end of the day, these girls are someone's daughters, you have sisters, you have mothers, you have grandmothers and, you know, treat them the way you would want to treat your family members. So um, that's 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 huge. You know, I think that's honestly I think that's a good good way, honestly, to, to kind of define of how you should conduct your life. Right. How you, you treat women in your life and you, you do that and you'd probably be OK. So, yeah. Um, a couple of things we, we have here, too, a couple of leadership myths. Um, we just kind of break down, you know, leadership. People have these ideas of what it means to be a leader. And, you know, these are a couple of different ways you can be an effective leader. Like really, it's an infinite. There's an infinite number of ways that you can be an effective leader. So that's why I left that first bullet point blank. Right. Effective leadership requires blank. Well, you fill in the blank because what at EC Glass what's required for us to have effective leadership could be very different than what it looks like in your school. So, uh, excuse me. And then even on an individual basis, right. For, uh, you know, the quarterback, for him to be an effective leader, could, he may, he may need something different than, than the offensive lineman, than a, than a defensive back. You know, each person is different. What was required of them to be an effective leader. Uh, another myth, I think that leaders are born, not made yet. Yeah, you can be born a leader, right. Naturally a leader, but I also believe that, you know, few real leaders are pedigree, like 100 percent. Y'all heard me talk about it at the beginning. Um, I think a lot of my leadership style, I take a combination of what I learned from the guys I coached on them. That that's not my pedigree. You know, I don't come from a coaching family. I'm the only coach in my entire family on either side of the family. So it's not like I was born to be a football coach necessarily. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think leaders can definitely be made. Um, leaders don't have to be charismatic either. You know, I think sometimes we think that you have to be this person that everybody likes because, you you know, you have a way with words. But that's not true. I don't know what y'all know about Chris Jones, but he was not very charismatic. <laughs> and that's that's my that's my guy. But Coach Jones was not a charismatic, charismatic guy, but he was 100 percent a leader. I think you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I think Coach Jones to this day is the only coach in VHSL history to win back to back state championships in two different divisions. Um he won at, I think, 2A, Bath County, and then he came and won Heritage my senior year when we were 4A. Um, so that's he's a leader, clearly, but not charismatic. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You don't have to be well-liked, and, and I think, honestly, most most leaders are sometimes not liked. They're not always the most popular guy. 
because leaders gonna it's gonna require you to kind of go against the grain. It's gonna require you to 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 be alone sometimes. So sometimes leadership requires you to sacrifice being liked or being having friends. And so uh, we just talked about that. We talked Coach, about. Can being, I ask you something about that yeah. real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, that's something that's been that was burning in 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 my head in thinking about talking to you today. Um, that I I just think is 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 the most difficult challenge that we face in all of this is is getting these guys to feel comfortable enough in themselves to, to to tell somebody else on their team i care right. too much about you to yeah. let you do things wrong yeah. to yeah. let you not do it our way and this right. is how we do it right and they're so much more likely they're they're willing to sacrifice the culture in order to not lose the Friend. the appro- approval yeah, and, and they're so insecure about um, their stance and their place in the world. How do you guys, in, you know, empower these kids to, to, you know, hey, this is how we do it here. Yeah. You know, um, or bring the others with them uh, yeah. and, and make them compelled to, to do the things that you want them to do. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it definitely that's definitely a challenge. And I would be lying if I said, you know, we had this perfect solution for it. Uh, I think one thing we try to do, we try, we do try to bring in uh, guest speakers at least once a week um, to talk to our team after practice, usually a little quick five, 10 minute, you know, talking session. Right. And all of those are usually centered around empowerment, trying to empower our guys to do the right thing, to to be the example that uh, teammates need. So that's one of the things for us. Um, you know, I think it, it works sometimes, but again, like I said, you, you still have guys like some of your best players. Like we, we are, I'm having that struggle right now. One of our, our best returning player, he, he's going to do what he needs to do. He's going to lead by example, but sometimes he lets his teammates slide sometimes, you know, because they're friends. Um, so I think once they, I think understanding the greater, the greater goal, right. Understanding that, um, I try to tell them if if this person gets mad that you are trying to help them, then maybe they're not your friend to start with. Right. I want my friends to help me be better. Um, So, you know, correct. them. there's a way to do it. Right. Tell them, show them um, you don't have to be a jerk about it, but, you know, be positive and, you know, try to encourage them that way. So um, can I just say this is what I've always said about leadership. All, All leadership is is caring about the team Mm -hmm. and that doesn't matter if you're a good player or a bad player yeah you care about the team and you're a good teammate that's the greatest thing that anyone could ever say about a player is he is a great teammate if you're not a great teammate then you're a turd and you're probably bringing your culture down (laughs) on your team absolutely the the easiest job a coach can have is when his best players are his hardest workers yeah. And when your best players are not your hardest workers or they're turds, then you, you're going to have a very, very hard job as a coach. And the greatest teams, the coaches don't lead. You're the exactly right. Lead. So th- these are just things that we say. And I mean, you say it and you say it and you preach it and then it ends up some of the seniors don't do it, but there might be a freshman or a sophomore yeah. that does. Absolutely. So. I mean, it's a constant battle, man. And it's something you talk about all the time. I mean, leadership is just caring about the team. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. are you a good teammate? Yeah. You know, yeah, what, what do good teammates do? What do bad teammates do? Bad teammates leave practice early. Bad teammates miss practice. Bad teammates yeah. worry about their stats. Yeah. Good teammates sacrifice for the team. Winning is more important. Yeah. You know, One thing we tell our guys, my fault. Go ahead, coach. Go ahead. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, no, I was going to say, like, we kind of – all the things you were just saying, we sum that up, and we tell our guys, treat us like you treat your girlfriend. You you think about it, right? Anytime – seriously, because, like – and it's mm-hmm. – the guy's like, what you mean, coach? What's, like, think about it. If you're about to go take a shower and you, you're you afraid your girlfriend's going to wonder what you're doing, you say, I'm about to go take a shower. I'll text you back in 10 minutes. I'm going to bed. I'll text you back in 10 minutes. Every moment your girlfriend – is going to know you're going to be accounted for. Your girlfriend will know where you are every minute of your life. And I was like, you know, it's not that we're trying to control you, but we, if you're going to, something comes up, we need to know. Like, you know, we want to know first, we want to know if it's something we can help you with, but we can only help you if we know. And so 
that's kind of how we tell our guys, like, treat us like you treat your girlfriend. If you're going to be late for whatever reason, you need to stay back with the tutor. I bet you your girlfriend knows, you know, that you're going to mm-hmm. you can't you can't meet her before she gets on the bus because you got to stay back with the tutor. So we need to know, too. Um, and that's kind of how we sum up. Um, we we kind of sum up, you know, our accountability right there. Um, so I kind of skipped through the attitude stuff because we, we've kind of hit on that already. Um but, you know, one of the things the guys, you know, they want to know, like, sometimes when you talk about trying to develop their character, they kind of look at it as, you know, we're trying to uh, control them or change them or, you know, don't want them to be themselves. And so we, I'm a big proponent on my own the field coaching when we're doing drills or we're running the play, like why we do it. I explain why we're doing something. This is the why. And I think it's important for explaining the why on the character too. And, you know, let's, you know, truth, truthfully speaking, you know, these teenagers nowadays, they have a lot more access and exposure to things we did 20 years ago, um, 20, 25 years ago. So, you know, we, we, we we have to help them develop character because they have exposure to more things. Things are coming at them a lot sooner. Um, another one, I, that's that third bullet point. Most high school athletes, they're not going to play college football, right? And most college athletes are not going to play, play professional. So our job is also to equip them for life in the sense that you're going to have to have high character. You can't be late to work. You can't be, you know, you, you have if you have a wife and kids, there are people that are depending on you to be, to be there physically, emotionally. And so character is the way, you know, that's you, you, you focus on character and that just keeps you accountable, man. You know, we use that word a lot around our program accountability. And I think it just sums up a lot of stuff that a lot of things fall under being accountable. Um, just knowing that other people are dependent on you. You know, I tell my guys all the time, like I have no choice but to be successful or to do the right thing because I have other people depending on me. And I'm talking about my own family, right? My own biological son. I have to do the right thing for him. And so same thing with you being a member of this program, you have to do the right thing because there's other people depending on you. There, You have teammates, you have coaches, you know, and honestly, your family, some of them may have family members that are depending on them to maybe not make it to college or make it to the NFL, but they have to stay out of trouble. They have to eventually graduate high school and get a job to help around the family. So um, that's why one of the biggest reasons we focus on character right there. Like the, the greatest coach of all time, in my opinion, on this subject matter is Lou Holtz. And he has three rules and they are do what's right, do your best and treat people how you want to be treated. Yeah. And he, he was the best and he still is. I mean, it's just yeah. he's a great coach and this is what he preaches. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it all goes in line. That's character. Do do your best. Treat people how you want to be treated yeah. and, and do what's right. So, right. I mean, it's it, this is the most important thing. X's and O's and plays. Right. But if, if you can't trust somebody and they're not going to do their best and they're not going to treat people how they want to be treated, then you're not yeah. going to have a low character team. And, you know, a kid might not want to hear it, but their parents do because, yeah. uh, you know, usually when I have to call a parent and I have to suspend a kid out of the program, I don't like to kick kids out of my program. But if I have to suspend them from workouts or whatever, I always tell the kid, I said, me and your mom and dad, we're on the same page. Yeah. Like we want what's best for you. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. You don't make the grades. You're getting in trouble in school. You're not working out. So, like, you're the one that's not on the same page. Right. Like, you and your mom and dad yeah. are because I know what's important. What's what's important is what's best for you. Correct. So, I, th- this is this is great, Coach. I really yeah. appreciate you coming on talking about this. I don't even care how you run your 3-3 three, three defense or your 4-3 yeah. defense or 53. Like, this exactly. is what wins. Yeah, and- I agree. I agree. And that's why I thought, like – I'm a, I mean, I'm a firm believer, right? Most varsity coaches, I think, especially you talking about coordinators or head coaches, everybody's going to know X's and O's. And again, like at the end of the day, a three technique is a three technique. It doesn't matter if, if you're running an odd front or an even front. A three technique is a three technique. And so their assignment is going to be pretty much the same responsibility, give or take, right? You're probably going to be responsible for B-gap if you're a three technique. So, it's, it's, it's crazy because like – People have their preconceived notions about me and my team. We may be undisciplined or right. low character or whatever people may perceive. Right. But at the end of the day, what is the saying? It's like character is what you are when no one is watching. Yeah. And I mean, right. really, 
overcoming adversity. I mean, character is displayed by, you know, how you handle adversity when things don't go your way. Right. I mean, so this is, this is great coach. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, Yeah. I think it's, that's one thing we try to differentiate between your character and your reputation, right? There's two, there are two different things. I think one thing, I think it's probably the same quote you're talking about, right? Is, is um, reputation. Your reputation is what people, who people think you are, but your Mm -hmm. character is what they think you are basically, or what you are really. Um, So yeah, man, we, um, we try to harp on that and get them to understand, you know, all these different things. And uh, by the way, too, I forgot to say at the beginning, like this, this whole program, this leadership program is something that we do throughout the course of the year. It's not, we don't go through all of this in one day, right? We'll break it down. Uh, you know, this day we're going to talk about character this day, we're going to talk about attitude and so on and so forth. So we have sessions throughout the year uh, where we, where we go over this kind of stuff here. And we try to get them, man, it's hard to do. It's, hard, it's human nature, but especially with teenagers, it's kind of hard to get them to separate their character and their emotion. Um, but again, yeah, like, you said, like you said, go ahead. No, I'm just agreeing with you. Yeah. Uh, uh, what you were saying. About emotions? Yeah. 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 My 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 question that I was waiting, I'm just, I didn't want to cut you off because you're doing, you, you know, you're talking about the, the absolute uh, crux of this issue. Right. Is. Are you guys, have you found yourself uh, in in one or the other of two schools between we are all going to be this or you're going to respect individuality? I yeah. want you to be yourself, right. but align with us, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. because I find that um, I've been at different places now and there are different kinds of kids. Some kids really do want to be one. And yeah. other groups, and 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 certainly the place I'm at now, they they really value their individuality or who they think they are. Mm-hmm. This oh, is who yeah. I am. Yeah. You know, you're trying to change who I am. And yeah. I think the I, it's either one or the other, right? And and um, I wondered if you if you guys fell into one of those two schools, and if you did, you know, honor say, I want you to be yourself, but right. align with who we are. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. You want to go first, Coach Taylor? Or you want me? To well, I mean, I I don't think you could play for a coach like me and, and coaches that we have and not realize that hey, man, I can be myself. Yeah. Because when you're not yourself, you're not being genuine. Yeah. And uh, kids know phony, and you know, as a coach, all I can ask is that, like, I mean, I go go back to Urban Meyer. I mean, look at the guys he coached at University of Florida, he told Percy Harvin, he said, the only time I'll ever be upset with you, Percy, is when you stop being Percy Harvin. Right. Like, who, who do you want per- Percy Harvin to be? But anybody yeah. but Percy Harvin. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. let Percy Harvin be Percy Harvin. Yeah, but absolutely. It, 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 yeah, we're all working towards these same things. One, yeah. we're going to change lives. Two, help get you, get you to the next level. And then three, you know, we're going to build champions for life. So, like, we're – that's that we're all on the same mission. We're all, and if you're not on that mission, that's okay. You're just not yeah. part of what we're doing. You're on the same right. page. Right. That's really what I got to say. I don't really get too philosophical about. No, no, I think it's great. No, you're right, man. You're right. You're in the nail on the head. It's not too philosophical. And I, okay, I got to keep going. I'm sorry, man. Go ahead, this, go ahead. this is really what I like now. Okay. Go so so you, you got Bill Belichick. He coached Lawrence Taylor. All right. Lawrence Taylor. He, he was a wild man. You oh, got yeah. uh, Urban Meyer. He coached Aaron Hernandez. Now, yeah. Bill Belichick coached him too. Right. All right. So then Nick Saban. Nick Saban's coached some guys. Uh, the, the guy that just got in trouble for the DUI and, and killed yeah. the person. Henry, Henry Ruggs. Ruggs. Now, all three of these guys are s- supposedly disciplinarians. Right. Okay. Right. But were their players always disciplined even when they were not around that coach? And what was it about that coach yeah. that caused those guys to be able to conform and to do what they were supposed to do to, you know, win? Right. You know, that's what I kind of think, because sometimes as a coach, mm-hmm. people come to me and say, well, Troy, you know, your players are outside and they got water guns. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's great. You know, <laughs> it could be a lot worse. Yeah, but, absolutely. You know, you really can't control kids. No. Or people when they're not around you, but right. why do they act a certain way around you right. and a different way around someone else? And, yeah. and I, that's what I would like to ask Nick Saban and yeah. Bill Belichick and Urban Meyer. 
Like, yeah. how were these guys able to conform under you, but in other areas of their life, they weren't? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm I'm nowhere, don't claim to be the, the coach that either three of those guys are, but I think it has a lot to do with the culture that they have established in that place, right? So they know when they're at practice, when they're on campus, when they're in the presence of their teammates or coaches, this is the expectation. This is the culture of this environment, right? But then in a different environment, it's a different culture. So they kind of are committed. Adapt. Yeah. They're like water. Exactly. I mean, they adapt. Yeah. So I think, yeah, you're absolutely right, man. Um, you know, we've we've had even at Glass, um, we've had guys that were on the football team um get in trouble in the community. Um now, thankfully we haven't had that within the last uh, probably three, four years, but 2016, 2017, I remember very vividly, we had guys that got in serious trouble in the community. Um, but they around the team, like what? Like I never would have guessed that kid would have that type of uh, even the, the ability to, you know, or even would be in that environment. So I think it just goes back to like the culture of their environment, honestly. And, and that's why Hopefully, you know, what we hope with us trying to develop the character and the culture of our guys is that hopefully they'll consider when they're in the community or when they're not in our environment, hopefully they'll consider uh, the fact that they are part of another family, right? Our football family, when they are going to make a decision that could be a life altering decision or what might be considered a bad decision. Right. I, I hope that's that's the whole purpose of us trying to develop these guys, because you mentioned it. Right. Champions for life is the ultimate goal. Man, it's nothing. It's no greater feeling, you know, having a guy that you coached, seeing that guy go on to be uh, have a have a stable job, be an upstanding member of the community, be a great father, be a great husband. And, and, and you see that kid you know, 10, 15 years yeah. down the road, whatever the case may be. And he still calls you coach. You know, I, I started coaching pretty young. Um, I, I, I started coaching at my alma mater when I was 19 years old. Um, so it, I literally coach guys that I played with. <laughs> like I was a senior and these guys were like freshmen. And so I was coaching guys that I played with and they still call me coach like to this day. And so, you know, I think that's the greatest feeling. And, and I think that goes back to, the environment and the culture that that you build there um in in that so yeah but but just to, i mean i don't have the answers either scott but i mean billy mills he he went 0 and 20 i believe or maybe 1 and 19 over his first two years i mean he's won two state championships since 2005 it's going to get worse before it gets better yeah and, yeah absolutely I mean, it, I mean coach they had they had their hard times i mean we yeah. had people transfer out and everybody's dealing with that with the transfer portal. Yeah. And I mean, I guess, I mean, with, you can have a webpage, you can have an Instagram, you can have a Snapchat and I mean, you're important. What you say is important, but I mean, I, I always say like, okay, like, well, is that the way the bill Belichick does it? Like, is that the way the Patriots do it? Is that the way Alabama does it? Does Nick Saban allow that? Like, does Nick Saban allow a guy to come late to yeah, practice? Right. Like, you got your headphones in. Does Nick say, I kind of like bring it on to like, everybody wants to be an individual, but like, well, how does the best do it? You know, it's, exactly. I mean, I'm pretty sure like Pete Carroll, I mean, it, everybody's different, man. Yeah. That's, like, that's what I'm wondering. You know, I'm, I'm wondering like, Music at practice. Okay. How are we doing that? Um, what are we wearing at practice? What are we wearing at workouts? Is that important? Um, yeah. the, the, okay. The I got the answer. There are great. From Mike like, Spencer. like if the, it does the, not have a direct impact on winning on Friday night, he's not worried about it. That comes from a state championship coach in Florida. If it yeah. does not have a direct impact on winning on Friday night, he doesn't care about it. Now me, I don't care what color shirt you have on or shorts. I just <laughs> yeah. want you to be I'll just there. give an example. And I guess it's certain, there's levels to this. You know, and you think about yeah, we want individuality. Thing. Yeah. If we can just get right. them there, okay, good. <laughs> right, you worked out. That's good. Okay. So music at practice. Yeah. I've done it. Yeah. And dude, I, I have to be able to coach. Like, yeah, you can't have it out over. There might over be a time shadow. for it, but there's a time when we're coaching individual. I don't need uh you know, music and I, we got to install or we got to like, it's a Monday or Tuesday and we got to like, I, I mean, I, a lot of times I run the scout team. I got to, 
you know, simulate Holland Springs' offense. Yeah. I mean, I don't have – I have to teach you their entire offense, scout team guys. So, right. like, yeah, we can't be bebopping and listening to music at that time, you know. But, it, dude, it's a th- – like you said, it's a thousand different ways to skin a cat, and there's no one way to do it. Like, Coach Bedwell was one way. Billy Mills is another way. I mean, there's been six state championships this year, and I bet you all six guys are different. Yeah. It's just like, what is your way? Right. You know, yeah, you uh, when it comes to those emotional responses and then the character responses, that's really kind of where I was focused. Like, you know, the guys are going to they're going to be emotional and they're going to respond emotionally because that's human nature. And how yeah. do we get them? How do we convince them that, OK, look, life is better lived on this side because you're you can make better decisions. You think clear. OK, you're you're, you're the best self now, that you have. You're, you know? you're getting deep right now. OK, yeah. because you're getting into something called emotional IQ. Do, do you know anything about emotional <laughs> IQ? Yeah, I took a lot of psych courses in grad school. <laughs> OK, so I don't know anything. I just heard Jay-Z talk about it with Kevin Hart and he talked about his dad and his dad was never there. And he did not understand that as a kid. And that made him angry. But then when he found out that his dad was never there because he was trying to find out um, like who killed his brother because the cops didn't care. Yeah. He understood. So emotional IQ, you've taken more psychology classes than me, but emotional IQ to me means that I understand my emotions and why I feel the way I do, but I also can understand other people's emotions and why they feel the way they do. And then with everything that I come in contact with, it could be like Martin Luther King. He was a leader. 66% of the people did not approve of him uh, when he died, but he had people that were anti-civil rights that didn't like him. He had people that was on the civil rights uh, side fighting for uh, black civil rights that didn't like him because they thought, Oh, this guy, he thinks he's all this. And you know, there's haters everywhere. So, Emotional IQ. I mean, I never knew this until Jay Z talked about it. Um, I mean, I, 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 we talk about that with my my class and, and with our team. You know, yeah. why do you feel the way you do? Why does yeah. someone else feel the way they do? Right. I mean, you're you have the. Ha, have you ever heard a coach tell you that, Scott? Yeah, mostly it's just been the ability to separate how you feel right now from what that person's saying and. And, and what the message is or what you're trying to convey to somebody else or what you need to do. Um, so give me a specific for us in example. Football, it's just, well, well, for us in football, it's it's an ebb and flow throughout a game, right? It's it's something's happened on the field that's not good. That's that's the easiest one that we always use. And, um, man, that's that's going to get my emotions up high. Yeah, You know, um, how am I going to respond to that? You know, my response to that is the most important thing. If I can separate the frustration and, and figure out what's next. And then I'm worried about what, what, what can actually help me achieve the outcome I want, which is. Yeah, well, what is that Urban Meyer point. thing? E equals O plus R or whatever e plus it is. R equals o. Yeah. What is it? E plus R equals O. I mean, I, I the, think that's your answer. I mean, that, that's that, the focus three. Uh, yeah. So mentality, I mean, right. The, the but, coach at Salem high school, he, he talked about momentum in a game and overcoming adversity. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 master coaches are great at yeah. that. Like, yeah. how about Jacksonville? I mean, what, what um Trevor uh, Lawrence like just David. said about Jocko, good. You threw four interceptions, Jocko Willing, good. good. Yeah. Did y'all hear about that? Yeah. yeah no, nah, I didn't. But like, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what he said. He was like, that the coach showed him that at the beginning of the year. Like, yeah. well, good. I got this guy suspended <laughs> from class. Good uh, from school. Good. Well, we'll just find someone else to play. So yeah. I mean, it's. I guess, like you said, it's how you yeah. respond. Extreme right. accountability. Oh, I'm yeah. sure you're going to go over that because this this levels of leadership is is really cool because it you know the the hardest thing I think yeah. to get across to these kids is what you guys are talking about right now verbal leadership and and using that to you know I, I'm going to let you I'm going to Jermaine I'm going to let you take you over saying. yeah uh, but I want to say my dad always said that I would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Absolutely. And that's a big, long poem, but that's what I tell our kids. They don't even know what a sermon is. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Absolutely. So, so go ahead, Coach. That's a, no, nah, those, those are wise words. I, I might steal that. So, 
Uh, it's a very see, long poem. It's great. You might see me quote you on Twitter on that, man. Yeah, yeah. that's Little why I'm quote, doing quote this, your man. dad, right? Yeah, it's, Shane Reynolds told me I should not do this. He's like, Troy, you should not do this because you're going to talk too much and you don't want people to know how you think. <laughs> and th this is really how I think. So, yeah, no, nah, that's great. People that don't know me, you're watching this and you're really yeah. getting to know me because this is yeah. how I operate. Yeah, absolutely. Same with me, man. Like, I mean, I think, you know, it's kindred spirit here, man. You know, I feel like, you know, it's our first time really conversating. But yeah, I'm the same way, man. My girlfriend tells me all the time, like, I get, if I go out somewhere, uh, we're, I'm going to get held up because I was running my mouth probably. So, you know, talking to people about who knows what, any and everything, man, any and everything. But, um, so for, for the sake of time, this will, I'll just I'll leave with this one, the five levels of leadership, but like, and, and the, the levels of leadership here, um, I, I, the pyramid is broken up for a reason intentionally, because obviously you got the, the leading by example is probably what most people do, honestly, right? You don't have a lot of people that are vocal. Uh, most people are going to show up, put their head down and go to work. I mean, we had two kids, two twins. We have two twins on our football team. Um, they're both juniors right now. They have not missed a workout in their high school in their high school career. Not one workout, but neither one of them like touch the field for us, right? They're the lead by example type of guys. Um, but but because they're not verbal um, or they're not one of the better best players on the team, um, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily, people don't look to them as leaders. I, they're the first people to come to mind to me when you talk about the type of kids you want in your program. I mean, you're yeah. a junior, you're a junior in high school and you haven't missed one workout. Like <laughs> I think maybe they miss one because of some family circumstances, but that may be one. And I might be making that up, but, <laughs> um, but seriously, right. You have the, most people I think lead by example, they don't say a whole lot. Then the verbal leadership, I think, as you said, Troy, you rather see a sermon instead of instead of hear a sermon. It's easy for people to say the right thing. And that's why I put that at the bottom. We, we all can say the right thing. Um, but are you going to do the right thing? And I, I'm, the leading by example is probably, you know, where the majority of people fall. Right. They're going to show up, do what they're supposed to do, might not say a whole lot. Uh, but the pinnacle and the smallest percent of leadership. And I said before, I believe, is being a servant. You have to be a servant leader. Um, you know, one of my favorite one of my favorite quotes of all time um, is, you know, by Lao Tzu. And it's, you know, the, the best leaders. I'm paraphrasing. It's a quote. So I'm but I'm a paraphrase phrase this quote. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the best leaders, the best leaders are, are those that when it's everything is said and done, the people will say we did it ourselves. Right. They don't even give the leader credit because that leader is a servant, that leader, that leader is not there for, for credit. That leader is not there for rec uh, recognition. You know, the best leaders are servants and they help people be better. And that's ultimately what our goal is with our uh, leadership council and with our program is just helping other people be better, but equipping our guys to help other people be better. And so I broke down here like different levels of, of leadership here. Um, you know, a lot of people lead, People are people follow you because they have to because of your position. Right. Um, there, you know, you you have a job, you know, as a head coach or even as a coordinator. But by, by my position, people have to follow me and by you guys position, people have to follow you. Um, and then but that's like an entry level leadership. Right. By position, they don't have a choice. They have to follow you. Um, but then, you know, you take it a little step further and by permission, it's based entirely on relationships. Um, people follow you because they want to. And that's a step above, you know, that's a step above having to. But that's because they want to. Right. And that's just the foundation, though. Um, I think, you, you know, those are long lasting relationships. And then level three is based on results. Like, are you the type of leader that get thing gets things done? And naturally, people are going to want to you're going to gravitate towards people that get things done. Um they, they want to do they they follow you because what you've done for the team. Um, they follow you because they see that sermon. As you said, Troy, they can see that sermon. They're not just hearing the sermon um, and then positive things happen um, because of your leadership. And these, the production level that is when you take other people you know, to another level. And then four is people development. What I talked about, you know, trying to develop people to help other people 
you know, be be a team, be a family. This is where you get to that level where your true team and family is built. Um, people follow you. That second bullet point is a big one. The people follow you because you have personally invested in them. Um, they know that you are there for them. They know that you want them to be better. They know that you have their back. Um, and that's level four. And then the pinnacle is the highest, most difficult level. Honestly, I, most people, I don't think a lot of people ever reach this level. I know I haven't uh, reached this level yet, uh, but it's just over time. I, I don't know that you ever reach the pinnacle. It's almost something you strive towards, right? I think by doing levels one through four, then you, you, you're you working towards level five, but it's almost like um, that the hamster wheel, right? Like you, you're constantly running, but not, not for for nothing like you're constantly running you're constantly working towards that level five of leadership by doing levels one through four right you do levels one through four on like a daily basis but over a lifetime it's a, a lifetime of leadership is the pinnacle so um and then we also will have our players rate ourselves at this point and in, in, in this point of the the presentation this point of the the session we actually have them rate themselves where do you think you are right now and your your level of leadership and we ask them to be honest. Um, you know, we'll talk about it with the ones that want to share. We'll we'll get them to share where they think they are and why they think they are at that level, and make them give examples, right, of where they say they are at that level. So um, that's just kind of, you know, how we some of the things we do, you know, at our program. I can share this. I'm willing to share this if anybody wants to see it if, or whatever. So anybody watching, if you want to comment, you can put your email, coach. I don't know if I have access to that, but. Yeah, I, I just want to talk about Saban and Belichick. Correct. I mean, they're, they're the two greatest of all time. Uh, if you have never seen the program that was done on HBO about Saban, yeah, Belichick, yeah, it's the best, oh, yeah, it's the greatest coaching video of all time. Oh, man, it's so great. And you know, they talk about you know trying to get up the mountain, and you're trying to get up the mountain and trying to get up the mountain. And then eventually, you become the mountain. You're what everybody else is trying to be. And, you know, that, that's what they've become. They've become the mountain. So, I mean, like Saban says, when when we win a game, it's no big deal. But then when someone beats us, it's, you know, like the Super Bowl. Um, so <laughs> yeah. that, that's one thing. And then, I mean, I, I, just to get back to, to Belichick, um, I actually know Saban. Uh, you know, Jules Montanar, I think he just got hired at East Carolina. He was telling me about when he interviewed with Alabama. You know, as a high school coach, we have such a great opportunity to talk to so many different college coaches. I always try to get one thing. But he told me um, when he interviewed with Saban, it was just him in the room. And Jules asked him, you know, coach, you know, what's your secret? And this is what Saban told him. He said, some people are good at evaluating talent. Some people are good at developing talent. The greatest of all time are good at both. You can evaluate talent, and then you develop a talent. The talent. I mean, I mean, that's. Yeah. I guess that's what leaders do. Yeah, you, know, you, absolutely. you can evaluate somebody. That guy, and that's another thing. My coach Bedwell, Coach Bedwell, is, you would say, man, that guy, he's wild. But <laughs> everybody on his staff, he got the most out of them. Yeah. He knew what that guy was good at, and he that guy was good at the equipment. You do the equipment. That right. guy's good. At every like he. He, he'd like squeeze the most out of everybody and right. what, whatever they were good at. Yeah. And that's what, that's what it's all about, man. Um, you know, you got to find people's strengths and not just, not just in your players, but you're right. I think just in people in general, the people in your lives, you know, whether that's your coaching staff or, or what have you, any, any type of relationship, honestly, right. Um, you know, people have different strengths and I think any type of team or organization you're part of when, when people, when people can operate in their strength, uh, they take pride in it, and you know they 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 want to do well um, because they they they're confident. They they take pride in in that strength, and then it just ultimately you know benefits the team as a whole. Um, you have everybody working at their strength and doing the best thing. So, I think that's a good point. Awesome. Is that Three the last slide? Huh. Is man. that the last slide, Coach? Yeah, well, it's like two more, but that's pretty yeah, much. Yeah, let's keep going, man. That, that's know, all. It's the last got one. Wives and families and everything, and y'all are good dads and husbands. Yeah, nice. Uh, nah, I sit here all night, talk to y'all. That's about you, it. man. 
That's you. So now this is the last slide right here. Is this the cost of leadership? We just kind of break down to, you know, the different, um, you know, the, the what's what's your what's it going to cost you? You have to sacrifice some things, you know, the price tag of leadership. We talk about a self-discipline. That's what it costs you. You have to be self-disciplined to be a good leader. Um, you got more potential leaders fail because of their inner issues than outer ones. You know, talk to Coach um, Scott, you talked about, um, you know, being your guys being confident enough or being insecure that they don't want to, you know, check a teammate or they don't want to correct a teammate. And so that's an inner issue, right? Like that, that they, and that kid is, has potential to be a great leader. That person has potential to be a great leader, but because they're not confident enough to express that. Absolutely. Leadership, right. Yeah. Then they, they, they fail. They honestly they fail at being a leader. Um, because and we they, feel like we failed as a coach, correct. you know, cause we didn't yeah. give them that. We didn't right. empower them. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, again, that third, that fourth bullet point there, right there, you know, we try to say, you know, live what you teach. And this is, this is for myself, just as much as it is for the guys, right? You live what you teach, you do what you say, be honest. And then you mentioned this, I think Troy, you mentioned this earlier, you know, putting the group ahead of you, right? Put the team, how much you care about the team. You know, you have to put the team before yourself. So, um, so couple couple things there for you know the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership right there from the law of sacrifice uh you gotta you have to give up to go up right you have to give up something to go up and i use you think about that like what do you mean well you think about it as a weight right if you put this in in literal terms right literal terms if you have weights weighing you down like say you're laying you know you have a 45 pound plate on your back well, in order to get up, you have to give up that weight. You have to remove that weight. And the weight in terms of leadership, the, the weight is that that um, self, the, the insecurities or, or the self pride or whatever. Right. You can use many different things for the, the metaphor, the weight metaphor. But you have to give it up in order to go up, in order to rise and be a leader um, and also to to elevate the team. All right. Um, again sacrifice i've used that word several times you know the true nature of leadership is not power and prestige being a leader does not mean you have all this power it does not mean oh look at me i'm prestigious i'm i'm this person or i have this job title it's all about sacrifice man i can't stress the the servant that servant mindset that servant word uh more um is a sacrifice um, and so that's one of the laws of sacrifice. And then when you become a leader, you, you lose the right to think about yourself, honestly. Um, again, it goes back to just putting others before yourself and being a servant, um, putting the team before yourself. Um, everything you do when you are a leader, everything you do, and you guys know this being head coaches, and I've had been fortunate enough, even though I'm, I don't have the head coach title, I, I've been fortunate enough where I have some head coaching responsibilities. Everything you do, you think about how it helps the team as a whole, right? How is this going to make the team better as a whole? And that that's just one of the sacrifices that comes with being a leader. It's not about what do I want to do? You know, I don't want who wants to who wants to go go meet on a Sunday or a Saturday. Right. You want to leave the comfort of your home and go to the school or however you do your meetings, whether you do the meetings on like it's not something you want to do. But again, it just comes with the territory. Uh, you don't want to you don't want to do. I don't like doing study hall like, you know, after after you had school all day and now I'm going to have my guys in the room for study hall for another 45 minutes before we go work out. It's not things you want to do, but it's not about me. It's about the greater good of the team. So um, so and that's that's ultimately the higher level levels. We try to get them to understand the higher level of leadership you you reach, the more you're going to have to sacrifice. So. You know, you want to go play college football? Okay, well, you don't have to sacrifice a lot more than what you're sacrificing now at the high school level. Not saying they don't sacrifice a lot now because we demand a lot of our guys, right? Like every, like oh, I'm sure you guys do too. But it's only going to be more. It's only going to be more demanded of you when you get to when you get to the college level. So, um, you know, that's that's where we end at. Um, and then it's just my contact info. So that's all I got, man. Yeah, j just thinking back to Lou Holtz. If, if none of y'all have listened to Lou, uh, make sure you go YouTube. And I mean, he, the guy used to sell VHS tapes for a thousand dollars to IBM. And all these, Man. I mean, it, it, you try to dub it and like it, it wouldn't record right. I mean, it's like it was crazy. <laughs> but like, how do you get what you want in life? And he said that 
help others, first you have to find out. Find out what other people want and then yeah. help them get what they want and you will get what you want. So, you know, Lou Holtz is a mastermind. If you've never studied him, help others get what they want. You know, those yeah. kids that are on your team. What do they want? Is it right. just because they want to wear a jersey? Is it because they want to get a D1 scholarship? I mean, that's something we talk about all the time. Yeah. Like D1 scholarship, that's great. I mean, but, you know, there's only so many Division One schools. And Josh yeah. Allen didn't have a D1 scholarship coming out of high school. Right. And Aaron Rodgers didn't have a D1 scholarship coming out of high school. So you might have to walk on. Yeah. You know, so. And recruiting is not an exact science. No, and, it's not. Not at you know, all. You, first of all, make good grades. There make you go. good grades. You have yeah. a 4.0, you can go anywhere you want. Be anywhere a good kid go. and work hard. And that's, there you go. that's it. I got, boom. You want That's what's important. Make good grades. Be a good kid. Work yeah. hard. Yeah, you need to put and that on. Saban talks about taking the butts out. Like, you be an and guy. He's yeah. this and this. Don't right. be a butt guy. He's this but, but right. He's got take, this. Take yeah. the butts out. Yeah, that's that's a good one. But you, you said you said Saban said that. Yeah, that's a was that on, was that on the HBO yeah. show? Because I feel like I've heard that. I don't know what I don't. I, I saved it because I say it, it again. <laughs> say it again. What he you said? take the ands? You, you take you take and put more ands in. Take all the butts out, so that when someone talks about you in the recruiting process, talking to the coach, they say, "Yeah, he runs a four four, and he's he's got all the metrics, and he's got a." 3.5 GPA and yeah. he's at every weightlifting. Right. And he cares about his teammates and he's a captain. Don't be a butt guy. He's he runs a four four and he's got the metrics, but he, he didn't make our 2.3 yeah. GPA. Or he didn't um he didn't come to 85% or more of our offseason. Or you know, he wasn't voted as a captain because he doesn't have leadership quality. Yeah. So be you a, know, Steven, be a I, hand guy. I wonder how many players that they bring to Nick Saban. And there's not many butts because Saban, I mean, I, I always tell these kids, man, it, <laughs> no. it, it, they don't have to find a reason to recruit you. They find reasons not to recruit you. Right. You know, you're, I mean, you can't control how tall you are. You can control how much you lift or how, how, you know, how fast you run, but you know, you can control your GPA. So like, don't give them more reasons not to recruit you. Cause I mean, that's what they're doing is they're look, well, I don't know. He might not be big enough. You know, he <laughs> might not be fast enough. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, cause that's what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect football player. I, right. I've never heard anybody Trevor Lawrence. They said was, you know, the, what did they say? Peyton Manning. Yeah. Like he, he's probably, they say he's a generational quarterback. Right. So, yeah, man. I mean, it's it, the, coaching is our ministry. Right. I mean, that comes from Joe Taylor. I worked for at Virginia Union. He'd been saying that for years. I mean, we are really changing lives. And, yeah. you know, we have more effect on kids than preachers do in a whole lifetime. Because, I mean, we have kids in the classroom and we have kids, um, you know, on our teams. And I want to say thank you because y'all the next generation, man. Y'all are going to yeah. keep this going and, and, you know, just make this the greatest country in the world as it's been for a long time, man. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate the, like I said, I appreciate the opportunity, man, for to get on here just to talk about our program. And I think, you know, you talked about to Coach Taylor, you talked about like a lot of the perceptions that guys people have of your team. It's the same around here. You know, I can't <laughs> I can't tell you like how many times, you know, when we post our team GPA, right? People are like, no, I know it. Like people like on social media and stuff, like they don't believe it, they think it's a lie. Like because it's EC glass and you know, our schools, like I said, the just by the, the location of the school in the city, it's in a it's in a rough neighborhood. The school is like smack dead in the middle of the city. You see on Twitter, I'm always posting midtown boys. Well, yeah. it's literally it's in the middle of the city. Yep. Um and like we're on lockdown. Uh I should be cautious saying this. We're gonna lock down a lot, but not because of what happens in the school, but around the community, you know. Like, so they do uh, caution. And so people see that kind of stuff on the news because, of course, the news only reports when something bad happens and something happens in the neighborhood. But it's all they report your GPA because three point four is incredible. Man, ain't it, though, man? Like ain't for 100 like, for 120 kids in the program, you know, nine right. through whatever, 12. It's that's incredible. Three. Yeah, I mean, that's like and that's I, tremendous. I mean, I just can't speak to the to the level of buy-in man from the guys at the end of everybody talks about like 
uh, like, what do you guys do? What do you guys do? Like, how do you guys do that at a school like EC Glass, right? Like where you have, like I said, 80% of our students get free or reduced lunch. And, you know, we have, you know, it's a Title I school and, um, you know, all these different, what people would perceive as challenges. Um, and I, I don't use the word challenge a whole lot. I like to use an opportunity, right? Every week, you know, it's an opportunity for us to do this, or this is an opportunity yeah. for us to do something. Um, and, but it's the guys, it's the people in the program. And, you know, we talk about having to cut guys or, or remove guys from the program that don't meet the GPA requirement. But you're talking about over the course of from 2016 until 2022, we've, it's been like four guys. So most of them meet the standard. You know what I'm saying? They, we set the standard. Yeah. It's not like we're kicking 20 guys out of the program. It's not like, it's not like we're getting rid of the guys who, we're, it's not like we're fluffing these numbers, you know, we've had to remove like four guys from the program over the course of like six or seven years. So, yeah, I, I, I want to say this before we sign off. You know, I, I drove for Uber and Lyft uh, for a while during COVID. And I, I used to go everywhere in the city of Richmond. And, and one thing I realized was, and I tell our players this, some of the best people live in the worst neighborhoods and yeah. some of the worst people live in the best <laughs> neighborhoods. Yeah, you're right and the that. one statistic, and, and this is the way I believe, I mean, because I, I drove all around, man. Yeah. I mean, the, the one statistic that Ron Prince told me when he was the head coach at Howard, uh, he said he's looking for unspoiled kids from unspoiled programs he's looking for captains of championship teams that's that's what he was looking for but the one statistic that i guess when he was with the colts that they looked at coach i'm gonna make it so we everybody can see us um okay the one statistic that they looked at and i tell our players this is does that kid have somebody in that home that gets up and goes to work every single day and shows them that work ethic. That That's the one statistic that they claim will hold true if a kid's going to make it in pro football is do they have that wow. in their house? And it that's doesn't crazy. matter about how much money's in the bank account. Yeah. It yeah. don't matter about the neighborhood. Woody Hayes, oh my gosh, there's a great video about Woody Hayes. And he talks about, having kids from low income neighborhoods and right. he says it doesn't matter it does not matter how much money no, is in that no. home it's about love does someone care about that yeah, kid absolutely you know, and have they seen that work ethic so sometimes kids are spoiled and oh, 100%. You know, we're, we're not we're a working class school and i haven't coached in a place that's like that but i mean everything that I'm saying, man, it's just, it's what I believe and it's what, yeah. it's what I preach and I live. So yeah, and I, I appreciate y'all. Yeah. You too, coach. And um, like I said, man, uh, you know, you could tell, you know, all three you know, uh, of us here, I think you can see the, the passion that you have for you, both you guys have for your guys and your program. So uh, you guys keep fighting the good fight, man. Yeah, brother. Thank y'all, man. Yeah, you too. Absolutely. Thanks it, for letting me be a part. Yep. I appreciate it, man. I talk for days.